Welcome to Your Mac Life for Wednesday, April the 27th, the last Wednesday in April 2016. This is show number 1089. I am your host, Sean King. Thank you guys very much for joining me, whether you're tuned in live, like the folks in our IRC chat room, or our Telegram chat room, or whether you're tuned in via the archive. Thank you guys very much for joining in and listening, however it is you so choose. As always, send us emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. If you want uh, your emails read on the show, give us your thoughts about anything we say during the show. We'd be more than happy to read the emails on the show or during the week, always to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. On tonight's show, we're going to talk to our good friend Jim Dalrymple of The Loop at loopinsight.com about, well, Apple's earnings. That's the only story there is today is, is how much... Let me get my, my there we go, camera set up properly. Uh, how much money Apple made last quarter, and just how doomed they are. Doomed, I tell you. There's no other way to describe it. Apple is, is just doomed. No, Apple's not doomed. Apple's not even close to doomed. Apple is, is in no way, shape, or form could be described as being doomed. It is a company that's got more two hundred and like I think it's like a. a half a trillion dollars in the bank i mean it just got insane amounts of money apple could literally do nothing for the next two years and and coast i was a mac user before apple was doomed again that's that's the tone but the 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 funny thing about all this stuff is that apple told us this was going to happen at the last conference call three months ago apple said we're going to have a down quarter compared to last quarter and yet the tech media, in particular the Mac media, portray this as as Apple is, is about to go under. It's still the most successful publicly traded company in the world. They made fifty they had revenues of fifty billion dollars last year. They sold fifty million iPhones last quarter. That's not a company that's in any kind of peril. And by the way, Tim Cook warned us this is going to happen again. The next quarter is going to be very similar to this quarter, a down quarter compared to last year. And we'll talk about that with Jim Darnpel on the show a little bit later on. We're also going to be doing in our starting point photography segment a uh, f- our first photo critique. This one's going to be from our good friend uh, Jason Painter down there in Sydney, Australia. He sent in a picture and gave me some details about it. We're going to talk about his photo, what I like about it, what I don't like about it, how he could fix it, how what he did well, what he didn't do well. If you want to get your photos in for our photo critique, please send them to me at onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. We'll do this about once a month with the photos we've got. We've got a few from other folks. Um, in our, uh, our our Telegram chat room, Steve Huther sent a couple of really cool shots that he took from a, a, a drone, a pano shot that he took from a, I think it's a DJ Phantom 2 drone. Really gorgeous shots. Um, good job, uh, Steve, on the edits of those shots, and, and uh, hopefully you... Uh, uh, we'll send some of those in for for the photo critique because that'd be kind of cool to uh, talk to folks about your drone photography. Last Thursday, I uh, got up, came to the computer, made my coffee, came to the computer, and the folks in the Telegram chat room were talking about this: the fact that Prince had died. I was like, "Yeah, bullshit." So I immediately go online to the usual news sources, and sure enough. It was true. Prince was my musical idol. He was my favorite artist. He was a strange little man. And little is the key word. He's only five foot two. I don't care about that. I don't care about his personal life. I don't care about who he slept with or what he did outside of a recording studio. All I know is that Prince's music made me happy. And even more than that, Prince's music made me want to sing. And if you know anything about me, you know I hate singing. I don't sing. I'm not a singer. I have the voice of a frog. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But I loved singing with Prince. I couldn't hit his high notes. Hell, he had some low notes I couldn't hit. But his music made me happy. His music gave me joy. And that's all you can really ask out of music that it makes you feel and there's no artist that I know of that I like that I favor who had more music that made me feel generally happy sexy funny uh, 
rude, inappropriate, scandalous at times. But it was always good music. On Thursday afternoon, I loaded up a playlist of Prince songs and put it on my iPhone and went for a motorcycle ride for a few hours and listened to Prince the entire time and sang in my helmet. I'd come to a stop sign and I'd be, I'd be I'm dancing on the bike. I'm just having fun. And <laughs> the funny thing was that night I came home and like all true Prince fans, I've got a copy of Purple Rain. And I watched Purple Rain. It's an awful movie. <laughs> I hadn't seen Purple Rain in you know twenty years. He couldn't act to save his life. I don't know if there was any decent actors in that movie. It's it's a bad movie, but the music is amazing. And like most of Prince's stuff, I would watch the the, the music parts and rewind it and watch it again. When Doves Cry and Purple Rain and and uh, Baby I'm a Star and all those songs on that on that on that movie were just absolutely incredible, but it's a it's a bad movie. It's another one of those movies that I, I I've talked about in the past where you 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 shouldn't you shouldn't um, if you saw them and enjoyed them when you were younger like teenagers or college don't watch again because they've changed or you've changed and they're no good anymore and. Like a lot of people, I went on YouTube and looked for Prince videos. And I was reminded of that Super Bowl uh, halftime show. And I don't know if you know the story of this, but uh, it's up on uh, YouTube. I linked to it on, on, on the loop. And the story was that the morning of that Super Bowl, I think it was 2007, uh, it was raining, and it never rains on the Super Bowl. They're in Miami, and it's pouring down rain. And the producer calls up Prince and says, uh, Prince, it's raining pretty pretty hard. And Prince says, yeah, I know. And the producer says, well, what do you want to do? And Prince says, can you make it rain harder? <laughs> and he came out, and if you watch the video, you realize it's a torrential rainstorm. And he is in his you know four-inch heels on a slippery stage and just killing it. Just killing utterly killing it it was like he wanted it to rain it was like rain was exactly the thing that he wanted to have happen at that moment in time and by god it did there was a strange story uh mac man says yeah how the hell did those dancers not kill themselves yeah the dancers were, were on in six inch heels too incredible video a really weird story though that um i got a big old hot spot where's that coming from Come from there again. Incredible story of uh, right now, it seems like he didn't have a will. His sister, uh, he's, he's got a bunch of siblings, half siblings. His full sister uh, um, reported in court yesterday that uh, she doesn't believe that Prince had a will, which is just mind boggling to me. That a guy who had so much control over his music, over the distribution, of his music over every aspect of his career wouldn't have a will. I know I got into a, a thing with um, Greg on uh, Twitter. He said, you know, a will will show up eventually. Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if it doesn't, that's pretty amazing. But if it doesn't, it's not necessarily that big of a deal because his siblings would have split up the proceeds. The only good news about Prince not having a will is the fact, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, that um, he has a, a literal vault in his recording studio in Paisley Park with thousands of songs that have never been released, hundreds of albums that have never been released, at least 200 full music videos that have never been released. He would record all the time and never release stuff. So, undoubtedly... His siblings won't have the same emotions about those songs that Prince does, and they'll get released. That's the only good thing that can come of this. Is an incredible artist who died far, far too young will still be able to entertain us into our, certainly my old age. 
if you don't know Prince, um, go online, go to YouTube, um, watch his Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, bit with uh, George Harrison on, uh, not jo- with George, but George Harrison's induction to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And in particular, keep, if you watch that video, watch Danny uh, Harrison, George's son, as he realizes what Prince is doing. It's really kind of cool. Um, Macman says, the sheer amount of unreleased music he has is rumored to be incredible. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And this won't be cobbled together stuff either. This isn't going to be like, uh, for those folks who remember back in the day uh, when, when Tupac Shakur died, his, uh, his estate cobbled together a bunch of um, vocal tracks and mixed them with audio tracks that weren't supposed to go with that song, and it was, it was awful. But Prince's stuff is produced and recorded and just sitting in a vault. It's not loops. It's not riffs. It's full-blown videos and albums and songs fully produced by Prince. So we'll probably get another 10, 15 albums out of him over the next 20, 25 years. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. But it doesn't matter. I'd rather have Prince here than not. His music made me happy. And that's all I can really say is it, it, it did. Um, later on the show, we're going to be doing a photo critique from our friend Jason Painter in Sydney, Australia. If you have any photos you want critiqued, you want to get some advice on how to make them better uh, in general or specific, specific to the photo, send them off to me, Sean, at yourmaclifeshow.com. We'll do this about once a month, do a photo critique. But up next, we're going to talk to our good friend Jim Downpool at The Loop at loopinsight.com about Apple's earnings and the amazing issues regarding that all that and hopefully much more coming up this is your mac life Welcome back, folks. This is Your Mac Life. I am your host, Sean King. Joined in our phone room by our good friend, Jim Darrenpole of The Loop at loopinsight.com. Jim, how you doing? Well, I got a beer now. Oh, that's that's important. That means you're probably doing good. I'm doing fine. All right. Good Good. Good to hear. Um, uh, real quick, your thoughts on, on Prince? Uh, real shame. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was a fabulous guitar player and... Uh, you know, he wrote some some great music that I think was enjoyed by just you know people in so many different genres of music. Yep. 
Um, so yeah, real shame. Now I know you're a metal guy. You're 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 a metal fan. Did, did did he have any influences on that genre? I think Prince. People like like Prince have influences on all genres. Okay, I no. mean, you know, he he influenced. You saw the comments from Billy Gibbons and ZZ Top. Yep. I mean, you know, he influenced a, a lot of people, and it's the same with with people like Billy Gibbons. I mean, you know, he will influence and has influenced many different genres of guitar players yeah. so you know at at some point i mean i'm a metal guy yeah hard rock guy but you know you have respect for talent yeah and uh, you know when you see people that have a tremendous amount of talent uh, um pass away then that's sad i mean you know, and I, there are people out there that like Prince a whole lot more than I did. Me, yep. But, you know, I have respect for his talent. Did Was he considered to be a great guitar player? I mean, I loved his yeah. guitar playing. But it was interesting when yeah. I saw when, when it happened, it was pointed out that in Rolling Stone's uh, a list of the 100 greatest guitar players, he was like number 83. He wasn't very high on the list. There's that old joke that goes around that, People ask Eric Pla- Eric Clapton, what, what's it like to be the world's greatest guitar player? He said, I don't know, ask Prince. That's not true. Didn't happen. But right. the perception is that he was a great guitar player. Was he considered that way among guitarists? Yes. Really? Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, he, he was. I mean, when you look at, and he's 83 out of 100, but there are millions around <laughs> the world, you yes, know? That's true. Good point. Where would you be on that list? You know, oh, uh, near the bottom somewhere. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I don't. I don't know what the bottom of that list would be, but that's where I would be. It would be me. Uh, uh, you know, I the the guitars are. You know, it's it's quite a a group of people, guitarists, because I think they all have respect for one another. Yeah. And you know, Prince probably had respect for people that weren't in his genre of music uh, as well. And you know, I think I think Eric Clapton was probably one of the best yeah. um is but yeah yeah is one of the best but um you know clapton he's not fast he's just got feel you yeah. know yeah. i mean he's he's one of these guys where you just sit down and listen to him he's just great so yeah I think the most interesting thing, there's a, two parts of this one. The fact that it's it's been said, now whether it's true or not, we don't know, that he died without a will, which is just right. mind-boggling. But that he also passed away with an incredible vault of unreleased music. And the only thing about him not having a will that might be good is that that music should get released. And as sad as it might be to say, I'm looking forward to that in well, two or three this- years' time when the family figures out what they're going to do, they're going to start releasing Prince albums. Well, I think they'll probably do it for the wrong reasons. True. You know, true. They'll, they'll they'll do it for money. Yep. Um, and, you know, it'll end up like a Jimi Hendrix thing. Forty years later, we're still having Hendrix albums yep. released. You know, and that's it's kind of sad in one way because, uh, you know, Prince was very protective of his music yep. uh, to, to the point where he would negotiate with record labels yep. for for rights of their music. Yep. He would do it himself. Um, not not lawyers or anything else, and you know I just don't know that that any family is going to be that protective of his music the no. way that he was, and you know that could be good and bad. It could be good for the people that want more Prince music, but you know you got to think there was a reason that he he didn't release this stuff. Maybe he didn't want it released. No. You know, well and that's what Wayne says in the IRC chat room. He says it probably depends why Prince never released all of it. And what I've heard, I've been a huge Prince fan for, for years, and I've heard the rumors of this vault for, for many years as well. But what I had heard was that it was just stuff he had to get out of his own head. You know, oh, yeah. musicians and artists, they have noise in their head. They have lyrics. They have music they want to get out of their head. And so yep. he'll, he'll record it without any intention of releasing it. Now, I know you, you talked about talking before, where you record just guitar riffs and just, just record bits and pieces. The difference with yep. Prince is these are recordings of full-blown produced music videos, full-blown produced songs, and dozens and dozens of albums, not just yep. riffs. So I think he didn't want to release them because, according to Prince, they just weren't good enough 
for Prince at the at, at, at the time. So I think it means that they will get released eventually. Well, and then you got to ask if they weren't good enough for him, why would they be good enough to be released? Yep. You know, fair point. Fair point. Let's move on. Uh, Apple yesterday uh, announced uh, uh, Doom Gloom. Uh, the company is about to go to business. Um, they're going to sell everything off and just just go away. Uh, yesterday was an incredible day, wasn't it? If if only for the perception of what Apple announced versus the reality. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, uh, clearly they're doomed. I mean. I I was trying to sell off my iPhones today. <laughs> Nobody would even buy them. You know? It's um, a, it's actually re- re- remarkable, folks. If you get a chance to go to uh, uh, sixcolors. Uh, dot com, Jason Snell's uh, website, there's this wonderful chart of total Apple revenue in a four quarter moving average that shows Apple's revenue over the last I think it's five or six years. And if you look, yesterday's revenue is the third biggest revenue Apple's ever had in a quarter. Doomed. They're completely doomed. Because okay, the thing is, people don't realize that what happened this past uh, quarter is being compared to Apple's incredible quarter last year. And Apple said this. Apple said yeah. we weren't going to do as well this quarter as we did last year because we had this giant bubble of people buying iPhone 6s and 6s and 6 plus and whatever it might be that we, we weren't we weren't going to do as well this quarter that we put, couldn't possibly and yet it was still the third best quarter the company's ever had well and and what's funny is that some people were reacting like it was a surprise yeah well no it wasn't a surprise apple told us the last quarter that this was going to happen yep. so stop freaking out you know i mean when you look at these um, these bubbles, I mean, they opened up China more. They you know, maybe India, uh, you know, they opened up some markets. They released a brand new um, uh, design of a phone. You know, these are things that affect what happens in a quarterly earnings, yep. and and that's what happened with with Apple. And that's why they had such a great year. You can't always top those. They've done a good job of doing it so far, but it doesn't always happen. It would be real nice. I think part of the problem with all of this stuff is the way the media uh, portrays this stuff. The, the media doesn't seem to have any kind of perspective on these things. Again, from um, Six Colors, uh, iPhone units, again, the, the, the quarterly moving average, it was the fourth best quarter Apple's ever had in iPhone sales. It was a great quarter. If you take away last year's quarter the, the same time, this would have been one of the greatest quarters a- Apple has ever had. There's just no perspective in our media to get people to not freak out about this stuff. See, now you're just talking nonsense. I know, I know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, just, I mean, the... The fact is, P- Apple did have uh, this tremendous quarter last year, and you know it's it was great then. I mean, we weren't complaining that they were having a great quarter, but I think that we we all kind of knew that. Okay, well, where are they going to go from here? Yep. And I don't think at all that it's anything about you know, a bubble bursting or, you know, iPhone is finished or yeah. any anything like that. I, I I just don't think that's that's it. I, and, and the other issue, too, is that Apple could do nothing over the next two years, and they're still going to sell 30, 40 million iPad, iPhones every, every single year, every single quarter for the next two years. If they don't do anything... They have enough money in the bank. They have enough technology at hand to coast if they wanted to. Right. They could. They, they could. absolutely yeah. could. I mean, you know, what, what's what's going to happen? You know? The worst that could happen to Apple right now, the absolute worst thing that could happen is that they don't do anything for the next year. Like literally nothing. They don't renounce any new products. They don't announce anything. And they'll still make money. Hand over fist for the next year. Yeah, of course. It's it's just bizarre that the, the again the, the media 
just can't seem to get this idea wrapped around their head. This is, as I was saying in, in the pre-show, Wall Street requires immense amounts of growth, and Apple can no longer grow the way Wall Street needs it to. It's just not well, physically possible for the company to get bigger. They they can't grow with the types of, of growth that Wall Street wants. Yep. I mean, you know, and, and that's that's a big thing. It's a it's it's different than what Wall Street expects from other companies. Yep. You know, and you know, I mean that's going to happen too. I mean, Wall Street's going to expect Apple to do crazy things, yeah. and it can't always be possible. The problem with this, though, is that it, it as usual, it it um, makes the media clamor for the next great thing. That Apple needs to do something. They need to come up with a new whatever it might be, because it, the, the media thinks that Apple needs to grow, needs to jumpstart their their failed business as as the media will 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 portray this as um vala ashtar on twitter pointed out apple has 233 billion dollars in the bank with that money apple could buy uber tesla twitter airbnb netflix yahoo combined and still have 18 billion dollars left over yeah so there's no there's no doom here there's no gloom here no that's why they're doomed (laughs) exactly you know. it's, just, it's just mind-boggling to me that we do this every single time that that that, that the media never pulls their heads out of their asses to every time every single time every single time it, and it's frustrating too because this is not a hard story to figure out this is a very successful company making all kinds of money making all kinds of products that make people happy that they want to buy and yet the media keeps trying to portray this as some sort of bad thing that that apple is is uh, uh, not going to go any further there was a awful awful story on apple world today five recommended products apple should make now give me your opinion on these products that this guy thinks apple should make in order to pull themselves out of these so-called doldrums that, that they're, where are you just hold on <laughs> just, just stop it are, yeah. are you are you backing the truck up are you burning supper? <laughs> oh dear! Yeah, just, just relax. <laughs> well, it's noise, man. What's the noise from? Where are you? Just, just relax. All right, all right. I'll wait. I, I got my beer. I'm good. Go ahead. <laughs> so these are five products this guy thinks that Apple should build sell in order to pull itself out of its doldrums first of all a gaming mac yeah (laughs) all right do you think apple should should build sell a macintosh dedicated to gaming no 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 that's stupid stupid an echo killer an amazon echo killer uh you know i i haven't used an echo but uh Merlin does and yep. loves it. Yep. I would want something that did a bit more, though. Like what? Me. Well, I don't know. To be able to to actually control the house, mm. you know. And I think that's I, coming. I, I I think I think the the Echo is the first baby steps towards that too. And I think it's yeah. an interesting technology. I, I don't want one or need one, but I can see from people I've talked to who have them how much they enjoy using. Now the thing is. Most of the people that I've talked to who have an Echo, who like the Echo, are nerds and geeks. I don't right. know of too many normal people who have, like, and use on a regular basis the Amazon Echo. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that that's a tough one, I think. Number three, Apple antivirus for OS X. Oh, for God's sake. What the hell is wrong with you? Apple's not going to make any money off of that. They've already got security on the OS at a, at, a, at, a, at a basic level. There's all kinds of free software out there if you're worried about viruses or malware or that kind of stuff. And it would be Apple chasing its tail on a regular basis. That's not a product Apple needs to make. 
No, that's just, wow, that's what an awful idea that is. A real Apple TV, an actual HD Apple TV set. No, I don't think they need that either. No. An Apple fitness tracker. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, dude. This is what this guy wrote. And our, and our good friend Dennis Teller is, uh, agrees with all this stuff. Wow. Apple's already right. got a fitness tracker. It's called the Apple Watch, you moron. Yeah. And it's a great fitness tracker. Now, see, I would disagree with you on that, if only because it depends on what you need. There are other more feature-rich fitness trackers, but they don't do the other things that the I Apple say, Watch does. I didn't say something else didn't have more features. I said it was a great <laughs> fitness tracker. And but, it is. But I do believe that Apple's got a lot of room to grow that whole fitness tracker market with the Apple Watch as its base. Yeah. I think there's a lot of a lot of room there for, for Apple. So, yeah, I, I, uh, Mashables wrote, Apple needs a hot new product and it can't be another iPhone. I don't agree with that either. They don't need a hot new product. They sold 50 million iPhones last quarter. They made $50 billion wow. last quarter. They don't need another product i said it before you know it's interesting that people that uh, sit in their basement and write for a living know <laughs> know what apple needs but yet apple doesn't i mean come on you know i i just i hate these people that come out and say oh if apple doesn't do this they're yeah. going to be doomed yeah. well you know if you were that good why aren't you CEO of some big company <laughs> instead of sitting in your basement writing? I mean, I would never presume to to say, you know what Apple really needs? Yeah. They need a gaming Mac. Yeah, that's that's right. what they need. <laughs> that's right. You know, um, because if I was that good of an executive, I would be the executive <laughs> of Apple making a billion dollars a year. Yeah, no kidding. Hey, there was a, a story uh, you posted up on, on The Loop. Uh, he's done this for the last, the last four or five years. Tim Cook is uh, auctioning off for charity a, uh, a half-hour lunch with Tim at the Mac Cafe in uh, One Infinite Loop. That's something you should do at WWDC. Why? Because I think that would be kind of cool. Auction off for charity. You, you know, you pick your, your, your favorite charity. Auction off a, a, uh, a half-hour lunch with Jim Downpool at WWDC. Well, I'd have to pay somebody to show up. No, you wouldn't. I guarantee you, you'll make at least $5,000. No. Yes. Oh, I, I promise you that if you and do... And besides, all that would be for lunch is Heineken. Well, then that's okay. That's, that'd be fun. You can have it at the Chieftain. Yeah, right. Like lunch with Jim at the Chieftain for half an hour. I'm going to set that up. Would you, would you do it? If I set it up, would you do it? No. Why not? Because why? Would, wouldn't work. Why, why Why wouldn't it work? It wouldn't work. I'm telling you, it um, wouldn't work. Let, let's try it and see. No, that wouldn't work. Oh, man, you never let me besides, have any fun. Besides, anybody that goes to the Chieftain can have lunch with me <laughs> any day they want. That's a good thing. Yeah. to pay a dime. Just go. You'll be there. Just, just, just go. And it's funny because the, <laughs> the whole table was filled with Heineken the people buy me and I just sit there and drink. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Nobody would pay for it because you're gonna be there anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean there's there's no question as to where I'm gonna be. <laughs> That's right. That's right. What about um you've changed it up this year for the uh, WWDC beard party. You're partnering up with the folks at iMore, but it's not karaoke yep. this year. Why not? Um because I wanted to do something different. Why? What's wrong you know? with karaoke? Karaoke was cool. I decided to uh, to have a couple of bands yeah. and change the venue to a, like a concert venue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and have a couple of bands come in and, you know, really, really have a like a concert type thing. You know, same beer and wine, you know, but just lay it out there and have a big show. Nah, you could have done. You could have still done that with karaoke, though. I think karaoke was cool. I thought I'm not. I'm not going now. Mm hmm. And ask yourself why I made the change. <laughs> well, 
Well, I hope it's a big success. I know the other ones have been a big success, and I hope this one is a, a big success. Now, we've talked about WWDC in the past, and, and both of our inability to understand uh, any of the, the, uh, the sessions that go on, you couldn't give me yeah. a ticket to WWDC because it would be a complete waste of time. That being the case, why do you go? Um, well, I go to report on things because I can talk to developers outside of the session. Yep. Um, you actually learn, you know, stuff? I, Oh yeah, I yep. do. You know, it, it is a good place. I mean, I, I've been going for years without a ticket and I know a lot of developers have been going for years without a ticket. Yep. You know, you can still go and, you know, the chats at, at Chieftain are, are great. <laughs> exactly. No, really. I mean, a lot of people go down to the Chieftain yep. and just talk. And, That's right. You know, it's great. It's great to see. It's gotten horrendously expensive, though, to, to for a it hotel has. down. For those folks who may, who may not know, back in the days when we were going to uh, uh, the Macworld Expo, when Sly set up the uh, the hotels for us, we were paying about 150 bucks a night at the Intercontinental, which is the hotel attached to the Moscone. You can't get any closer to Moscone than the Intercontinental. And um, we stayed at a bunch of different hotels, the Marriott, the, the Intercontinental, uh, the, I think one's called Park, Park 55. Park, That's right. Park 55, one. yeah. And someone was asking about hotels, and I suggested the Intercontinental. I said, we can't stay there. It's $600 a night. Yeah. And that's only in the last five years the price has gone up that way. I'm glad there's no Macworld Expo in San Francisco anymore. We couldn't afford to go even if we wanted to. Yeah. I mean that's that's a pretty hefty price, six hundred bucks a night. You know, for for folks who are who are whose company send them to these things, the company writes those prices off. That's fine. But for a thing like Macworld Expo, you very few of us have our company send us. We had to pay that money out of our own pockets. That's just obscene. The price the price <coughs> increases. Yep. Yeah, it really is. It really is. But, and you know, I I don't even really like San Francisco as a city. So really. Oh, I don't. No, I think San Francisco is just pretty dirty. Yeah, true. I, I, I won't, uh, won't disagree with you on that. You know, there, there are places in San Francisco that are fabulous. Yeah. You know, they're great, great sections of the city. But the downtown core, where the conference and everything is, yeah. it's pretty. It's a pretty dirty city, and they don't do they don't do anything to to try and clean that up. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It can, so. it, it, it can be a little gnarly at times. Apple has released yeah. uh, two new iPhone ads, one called Onions, the, the other called Fingerprint. So what do you think of the two new ads? I thought they were great. I didn't like Onions. I wasn't a, I'm not a fan of Onions because it, 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 it seems to try to be a satire but fail of the vacuousness of the Internet and of our, our celebrity-focused culture where everyone has to be famous for – 15 minutes. I wasn't crazy with that one. I really like fingerprints, though. Fingerprints was kind of cool, if only because of the voiceover. The, the voiceover on that ad, I think, is was brilliant, like they have in, you know, on several of the newer ads. They've had this female voice. It's got a, a wonderful sense of humor to it. So I really like the – I haven't seen them on TV yet, though. No, me neither. But like I said when I posted them, nothing's going to do Cookie Monster at this point. So. <laughs> You're still a big fan of Cookie Monster, are you? Oh, I love that Cookie Monster, <laughs> especially uh, – Oh, me get hit with sleep. <laughs> me okay, me trooper. They, they could just run an ad of the outtakes, and, and, and it would be just as good. Oh, better. The outtakes were classic. Oh, I wish me could shut my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> when we, um, uh, yesterday, I don't know if you saw that uh, both on, on Monday and yesterday, John Scully, uh, ancient CEO of Apple, was on uh, CNBC and he was being interviewed by uh, Brian Chafin at Mac Observer. The guy has no relevance whatsoever to Apple today. None. He wasn't. He hasn't been CEO of Apple in 25 years. Um, Wait, Br Brian interviewed him on CNBC? No, no, no. He was on CNBC yesterday, and uh, oh, Chafin had an interview I, with him on yeah. MacObserver.com on yeah. on Monday. Utterly, I thought Brian did a good job with that interview, though. He might have done a good job with the interview, but it's an utterly irrelevant interview. The subject well, matter is utterly irrelevant to, to, to today's Apple. Well, I, I mean, there are a lot of people that you could ask about Apple, whether they're inside the company or outside the company. And, you know, 
you can if you get a chance to interview Scully, then why not ask him? Yeah, but you know the, the reason why I mentioned that was because there was another story that that came up. Was says Apple should pay fifty percent tax the same way I do. People, can we please stop interviewing Waz about shit he doesn't know anything about? Yeah. Waz is just gibbering now. Yeah. And Waz, if you have a problem with the amount of taxes that Apple pays, don't blame Apple. Well, I I don't even know what to say about Waz. It's I, just, I, I love Waz as a person, and I respect him for what he's done, but... These interviews that he does where he expounds on things he doesn't know shit about just makes him look stupid. And it's embarrassing. I feel bad for the guy. You know, it's different if, if you're just two guys sitting in a bar bitching about the fact that Apple doesn't pay enough corporate income tax. Well, that's, that's okay. You're, you're still an idiot. But at least you're not being a public idiot like Waz is here. Yeah, I mean, Apple pays... What, more taxes than anybody else in the U.S. at this point? Apple so. pays exactly as much tax as they're required by law to pay. Right. If you want that to change, change the law. And that happens to be more than anybody else. Yeah. That's that's the way it is. Don't you know? suddenly expect Apple to go, you know what? We're gonna, you know these billions of dollars? We're going to start giving extra billions to the IRS. Just because yeah. we're nice guys. That's not the way it works, people. No. Not the way it works. <laughs> On uh, Sunday was the one-year anniversary of the Apple Watch. Or do you have your Apple Watch on right now as we speak? Right now, every day. Do you, do you, so you do, you do still wear it constantly? Every day. It's interesting to see that you know one year later, all these people are coming out saying, yes, they do, no, they don't. They, they do it on, on occasions. Is it still of value to you? If, if a year ago I said, hey, Jim, in a year's time, this is how you're going to use the Apple Watch, would you still have bought the Apple Watch? Yes. What does the Apple Watch not do that you want it to do? Um, well, I I would like to see it be faster. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a big complaint more, I hear. More, more powerful. I mean, I press, you know, on my home screen, I press the rings to, to open them up, and it just kind of sits there, and it locks the phone up. Yep. Uh, so, you know, sometimes I wait for it, and other times I just say, eh, whatever. Yeah. You know? And that's so, gonna, that, that's gonna be, that's gonna be pretty frustrating too, isn't it? Especially nowadays, we're so used to all of our devices being instant on. To have a device that feels right. like it's out of the mid '90s is a little frustrating. Yeah. So that part's frustrating. I mean, you know, the 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 other tracking stuff, like maybe sleep and stuff like that, that might be uh, nice to have in there. Um, but yeah, I think speed is my main complaint right now. And but, if it, it still tracks everything. It still does everything. And if that's your main complaint, we got to believe that Apple, obviously, A, knows that, and B, will fix that in the next iteration of the Apple Watch, won't they? Well, sure. I mean, things uh, things get faster and, and better all the time. So, What's the single best you know, thing that... your Apple Watch does for you? Hmm. Probably tracking. Now, it's interesting you say that because I, when I ask that of other people, they say notifications. Do you use your Apple Watch for, for uh, notifications? All the time. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the Apple Watch keeps me away from my iPhone. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting statement that so many people say? That's, I find that fascinating that, that people say that. Yeah. Explain that. Yeah, it's true. Well, typically you hear uh, you know a buzz or, or you hear an alert sound, and... Um, uh, you pick up your phone and then you're down the rabbit hole yeah. of checking stuff. Yeah. But with my watch, you know, it buzzes on my wrist and I just take a quick glance and see, oh, I, I don't need to deal with that. In a way, you know, I just leave it. Yeah. So I don't pick up my iPhone. I don't need to deal with whatever that particular thing was. And I just move on. And the advantage of being able to specify what comes on your Apple Watch, is, I think, is, is a big deal. I don't know if enough people understand that part of it. Uh, you, we hear people all the time complaining that their Apple Watch buzzes constantly. Well, it's because you haven't set yeah. your notifications up properly. If you set it up so that you only get notified from those people who are important to you, 
whether that be via email or via Twitter or Telegram or whatever other apps you use, then when it buzzes, you know it's important. It doesn't buzz right, for right? everything. It only buzzes for those things that are important to you. And, and you know what? I have, I just have the default settings. I have everything going there. Really? And, uh, you know, I get, I get a lot of stuff, but I always know what's happening. Yeah. So if I see something on my watch... I know that I'm not missing anything because it happened on my phone. Yeah. And I just left the default. I know that, that people complained about the watch uh, right from the first review. Well, it buzzes all the time, yeah. constantly. Well, that's because you haven't set it up and uh, you're a moron. Yeah. <laughs> so what about, you, can go you can go straight to hell. What about the idea that the um... – God, I love beer. Beer is good. We're Canadians. Of course we love beer. It's, it's in our genetics. What, what about the yes. idea that the um, the apps on the Apple Watch are, from what I understand, uniformly bad? That there are no, There's no um, killer app on the Apple Watch. Well, to me, the killer app on the Apple Watch is the Apple Watch. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it all depends on, on what you're looking for. Uh, the apps themselves, are they great? Well... I don't know that they're great. They're, and some of them aren't great. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that overall you could say that they're not great. They do what they're supposed to do, I think. Uh, and I think the developers are still kind of learning what they can do on such a small screen. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's a small screen. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't put too much information on there. I have hard enough time seeing already. You start shrinking stuff down, I'm going to get pissed off. Yep. Yeah. All right. You know, so I, I I think this is something that people are just going to need some time to, to figure out what is it we can put on this screen to make it useful. And what they've been doing so far, because of the way the watch communicates with the phones, is putting versions of their existing apps on those on the on the watch. The other issue, too, is that. Um the the processor on the phone just isn't powerful enough for what these developers are doing. But also keep in mind, this is the exact same thing happened with the original iPhone. The original iPhone didn't have right. apps either, or good apps. They had, they had web apps. But we used the hell out of them because they were new and, and different. The other thing you see a lot of people talking yeah. about is the Apple Watch isn't – the, the Apple Watch is a flop. And the response is always that, no, it's not a flop. It sold more in the first year than the iPhone did. Don't combine those two things. A, it's not a flop. It's rumored that Apple has sold 12 million Apple Watches over the last 12 months. And at 500 bucks and up a pop, that's not a flop. You can't call that a flop. But I'm not saying it's anywhere nearly success, uh, a success as the iPhone, the original iPhone, because the original iPhone was a whole lot different than the Apple Watch. Everyone needs a phone. Not everyone needs a watch. Well, you know, there'll be arguments both ways on, on all of that stuff, but I agree with you. I mean, you know, the, the watch is a success for wearables. Yes, that's right. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't think that you can classify it as a flop, yeah. but you know, is it, is it iPhone level success? Mm, no. Yeah. You know, has it sold a lot? Yeah. But, you know, <clears throat> the the iPod didn't sell like great guns starting off and and the um, uh, the iPhone didn't sell like great guns starting off. No. It's it's going to take some some time. I, and it's not going to take some time for Apple to figure out the Apple Watch. It's going to take some time for uh, Apple to figure out where they want to go with it. No. And for developers to figure out where they want to go. I think it goes back to what we were saying off, off the top of, of this segment. Our, our media doesn't give us perspective. It's all or nothing with these guys. It's either a flop or it's a huge success. And it can't, can't be anything in between. That there, there's no, the media seems to treat everything like a zero-sum game. It can only be A or Z. It can't be N. There's nothing, nothing in the middle of all this stuff. And the Apple Watch is definitely in the middle. It's not a sure it five-year down the road iPhone success, but it's also not a G4 Cube either. 
I love the G4 cube. Yeah, a lot of people did, but it was a flop. There's no doubt about that. No, the, the cube was it a was flop. It was not a flop. It was a huge it flop. It was not a flop. They sold less You're than 50,000 of them. You're a flop. It, it wasn't a flop. <laughs> it was an amazing machine. I don't disagree And I would with buy you. one today. Would you? I would. If, if Apple put the, I would. If Apple put, Apple put the guts of the, of the Mac Pro into a G4 cube, you, you'd buy the cube? Damn right. <laughs> Folks, have been talking to Tim Downpo of The Loop at loopinsight.com. Yeah, he had uh, John Gruber on the Downpo Report yesterday. Go to the iTunes store and check it out. Do a search for Jim Downpo or go to loop at loopinsight.com and find it there. The Downpo Report with special guest John Gruber. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sean. Talk to you soon, buddy. See ya. Bye. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't care what Jim says. It was a flop. It was just a flop. <laughs> it was a great machine. But, but, but it was a flop. It didn't sell very much. That's the definition of a flop. Not selling many. So, oh, I don't know. Almost FaceTime Vito. Sorry, Vito, if you're listening, I didn't mean to FaceTime you. I'll turn that off. Oh, well. Um, did you hear the story of, this is nothing to do with Mac or PC or, or computer or anything else, yet, but it was just, it just bizarre. The Naked Restaurant <clears throat> in London has 15,000 reservations. It's a restaurant where you get naked and have your meal. No. No. Not only do I not want to see me naked, I don't want to see you naked and eating. It, it, I don't know if because I, I, as I get older, the world pisses me off more and more. But that we, that the, I, the thing is, Someone came up with a stupid idea. And somebody not only came up with a stupid idea, they thought, yes, I'm going to do this stupid idea. And then he found 15,000 people who are stupid as he is who are willing to give him money to be stupid. I don't understand. I have these great ideas. I can't get anyone to give me any money at all. And yet this guy... You can get 15,000 people to sit naked in a restaurant. And there's people in the, in the telegram room were talking about the, the sanitariness. I don't even care about the sanitariness of it. For me, it's the fact that I'm eating. I don't want to watch you eating and being naked. Even my dinner companion, I don't want to watch them eating and be naked. No, no, that's not, no. That's not a good idea. That's an awful idea. It's, a, it's just a bad, bad, bad idea. Just don't do it. Just don't participate in that stuff. That's just, just, uh, Mac man, wait till you ho- spill hot soup in your lap. Exactly. Oh, they'll bring over one of those flaming fajita bowls and you get grease on you. No, that's just, no, no, don't, don't do it. Don't, don't be involved in that. <laughs> it's just an all around bad, bad idea. In our starting point photography segment, we've got a email from our friend uh, Jason. Stop that, Jason Painter. Jason is uh, down there in Australia. He is a, a regular, regular uh, uh, writer into the show. And thank you very much, Jason, for sending me in your email. Jason says, "Here's my photo." For background on this, he says, um, "I submitted this to a competition in my club, and was surprised. Hang on, let me get this so I can read it. And was surprised it did not generate much interest." I spent a long time in removing parts of the image that were distracting and in dodging and burning. These were some comments made by the judges. Looks like a slab in a morgue, a bed of some description. I can't help but wonder what's going on. Jason says, it seems that my photo did not communicate that this was a chair in an unusual setting and that negated the artistic touches I had made in the lighting. I've noticed that every photo I've entered into competition that I think is a winner does not do well. And I realize every time that it has significance to me that is not communicated to the viewer. I love the whimsy of this artistic piece in a historic location. And I'll, I'll show you the photo. <clears throat> there's, there's the photo Jason's talking about. He shot it with his uh, Nikon D5300. Uh, he had a uh, uh, 35, 300-millimeter lens, shot at F9, so everything is in focus, uh, one-thirtieth of a second, kind of slow, ISO 316, he edited it with Lightroom. Okay. So, first of all, look at the photo. And, and keep in mind, Jason, that 
photography is subjective, okay? The judges in the contest may not have liked the photo, but you did, and that's all that's really important. But I got to tell you, there's nothing of interest in this photo. There's no story of the photo. There's no drama in the photo. Maybe because it's black and white and it's kind of a flat black and white. Maybe because there's no decoration on the chair or the chaise lounge idea of it. There's no thing to, to attract my eye to some aspect of the photo. It sort of floats around without seeing anything of any real interest. The only thing that's of any real interest, and this is odd, is that grate in the upper left-hand corner, or the sorry, the, 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 the fence, the wall there. This is an example, I think, and I've talked about this many times on the show. This is an example, I think, of a well-composed image, <clears throat> a technically well-done image, but creatively, there's nothing there. Arkstein says, there is a draw to the photo. The questions about the main object are clear. MacMan says, yes, I have to agree. It's a nice shot, but there's nothing spectacular about the photo. The actual chair itself has got great lines. The lines that lead away from it um, draw your eye to, to, to those areas. But there's nothing really happening in the photo. There's no sense of that I want to sit here, for example, as there would be if there was a um, an attractive, comfy leather couch kind of thing. You can sort of imagine yourself in the shot. You really can't imagine yourself in this shot. There's no real um, draw to the image that makes me think, oh, yeah, I really want to sit there. That would that'd be kind of fun or interesting or whatever it might be. <clears throat> So again, technically, I think it's a really, really good shot. You, 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 you've got the, the um, your exposure right. You've got your uh, aperture right. You've got your your shutter speed right. Technically, it's a very good shot. The only thing I would say to you, <clears throat> excuse me, Jason, is if you can go back to this shot, back to this location, bring something with color to it. I imagine, imagine how this shot would look like if there was. Even on the ground next to the chair, a red rose or a balloon or uh, a doll, a stuffed animal. Maybe that would be, would give it some visual oomph. Eric Stein says, why is it so long? What's it used for? There should be more, there should be a few more clues. Maybe it's part of a series of photos. It's, um, uh, Eric Stein, it's a, it's a chaise lounge. It's just not very comfortable. It looks like a torture Torture uh, chamber chaise lounge, one of those one of those chairs. Exactly, that's what Sherry says. The chair looks like a torture device. One of those chairs, uh, those those um, lounge chairs you you sit on and, and relax with, with your legs out in front of you. So unfortunately, Jason, that's the problem with the image. I don't know if it's the same thing the judges said about it, but there's no visual excitement. I don't feel anything looking at the photo. And that's one thing I always tell folks in my classes is that you want to create images that make people feel something. And the feeling can be bad, too. So, for example, this image, <clears throat> I think it leans more towards the feeling bad if you did something to it, make it grungier. Uh, you said you used Lightroom for editing. Maybe you could play around with, with Lightroom and increase the contrast and the, the, uh, uh, the graininess, the clarity of it, to make it a little more foreboding. If it looks like a torture device, make it a torture device. Really, you know, grunge it up and, and uh, do some more, more work on it. Uh, play, with, play up the macabre aspect of it. The thing is, Sherry, he may not see this as a macabre image. We do, because that's our opinion of it, but Jason may not. Jason, I know you listen to the show live, so if you have any comments about what we said, please send us, send us an email. It's an, inter it's an interesting shot. Like I said, technically, you've nailed the shot. Um, from, from the technical point of view, it's a very, very well done shot. Uh, folks, if he'd been standing directly in front of it, it wouldn't have been any good. If he'd been standing directly to the side of it, it wouldn't have been as good. He's standing off to that angle 
And that angle allows the shot to draw your eyes through it. But yeah, I want to see more, more there, there than the what's the actually. But send, thanks for sending the the, uh, the 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 photo in, Jason. I I appreciate it. It's it, it's brave. It's a lot of not 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 everyone is brave enough to want to put their stuff out there for critique by complete strangers on the internet. So thanks. Just seeing if Jason is uh, listing and going to send a response. Nope. Send us emails, as always, to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com if you want to get stuff in during the show. <clears throat> uh, Jeff Franklin. Uh, I have a Nikon D5200. I'm just a beginner, but I would like to try bird photography. What kind of long-distance lens would you recommend? Um, Nikon D200 is a crop sensor, so it's got a smaller sensor than the, the big full-frame cameras. And that's kind of good on some long lenses because it, it gets you even more distance. You don't say where, where you live, but if you can, find out if there's a lens rental place somewhere around you. Uh, or use some of the online services if you're in the U.S. I'm a big fan of the nice folks at LensPro2Go.com. Excuse me. I have a heartburn. LensPro2Go.com. Send an email to Paul Friedland at LensPro2Go.com. Uh, great company. I love their lenses. What you can do is you can rent a lens from those guys. And and there's other companies, CameraRentals.com and, and, and others that will that will rent lenses. Rent a lens from them to see if you like that lens for the kind of photography that you want to shoot at. For bird photography, it depends on two things. Are you looking for um, static birds, birds sitting in trees, birds on the ground, or are you looking for birds that are flying around? Two different kinds of shooting. For static bird photography and a long lens, you're looking at a 300 to a 500 millimeter lens. You're looking at using a tripod because you can't hold those lenses steady because they're too big at those long zooms. For birds that are flying around, you're going to look at uh, a, a large shutter speed on your camera, not your lens, but up on your camera. That D5200, I'm, I'm going to guess, is probably at 1,000 frames a second. Sorry, uh, 1,000, one one thousandth of a second, or one two thousandth of a second, which would be plenty in good lighting. I was at a, uh, funny that you asked, sent that email in, because I was at a, uh, a bird sanctuary over the weekend. Uh, the owl uh, rescue uh, organization here in uh, Delta, British Columbia, and it's kind of a neat place because they they um, rescue raptors. Uh, I didn't know this until I went out there, but here in British Columbia, all raptors are owned by the government. You can't have a raptor as a pet. It'd be stupid to have a raptor as a pet, but you can't have a raptor as a pet here in British Columbia. So if somebody finds a uh, sick or a injured raptor. That raptor is owned by the government. By law, you have to turn that raptor over to a government agency. And then that government agency will then <clears throat> send the raptor to a local rescue organization. And these guys are really interesting because what they do is they rehabilitate the animals, uh, you know, fix broken wings and things like that, but with an eye to getting the animal back into the wild. They don't want to keep wild animals. They don't want to have a zoo of raptors. And what they do is they teach the animal, say it's a, it's a, it's a newborn chick. And what they teach the animal how to hunt, but they don't do it themselves because they don't want the animals to get used to, they don't want the birds to get used to human beings. So they use other birds to teach the, the injured animal how to hunt. So they minimize human contact as much as possible. Uh, they had uh, several bald eagles out there. They had uh, a golden eagle, which I didn't realize was, A, bigger than a bald eagle, but also very rare in this area. So it was a beautiful, beautiful animal. They had uh, some snowy owls. They had some turkey vultures. They had peregrine falcons. They had a whole bunch of really cool animals up there. So the problem I had was I brought my 2470 lens, and that was great for the static displays of the birds. Um, you folks have seen me in the past, seen my picture of the Sonzi 
is the um, bald eagle that I got pictures of uh, a while back. I know I've got a shot of it somewhere. Where's where's the? Uh, that's not right. That ain't that ain't it. Bald eagle. Where's the bald eagle shot? So this was a uh, a picture of Sanzi. Is uh, was a uh, a rescue bald eagle, <clears throat> fourteen years old, weighs like twelve pounds. Beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, that one is um, not for the wild. So he was on uh, on on the the trainer's arm, but most. So I got some great shots of Sanzi, but most of the other animals are behind cages, and so I had a hard time shooting. We couldn't get close enough to the birds for me to be able to shoot through through the cage. Um, so rent a lens, rent a, a big lens, a 200, 300, 4, the, the, you know, the bigger the millimeters you, you, you can rent, the better. I think five to 600 is probably the maximum. Um, but don't buy a lens until you've rented a lens and can play around with it and practice with it and know how it works. You don't want to spend anywhere between, on the very, very low end, $500, upwards of $2,000 on a lens that you haven't practiced with, that you haven't played around with, that you haven't... Uh, tried out beforehand and most of the lens rental places will if you wanted to buy the lens after you rented it will sell you the lens and apply your lens rental fee as a discount i know the folks at lens for to go every six months have a sale on older camera bodies and older camera lenses too so you can always check that out too great question it's it goes to the 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 um the heart of what I tell folks is when you go to buy a camera when you're a beginner, don't buy a bunch of different lenses. If you go to Best Buy or something like that and the sales guy says, hey, we can sell you this zoom lens for a good price, don't. Because you don't know what kind of photographer you are yet. He knows he wants to be a bird photographer. When I was first shooting, I didn't know what I wanted to shoot. It wasn't until years later I realized, oh, I like street photography. I like portrait photography. That's a different kind of lens then a bird photographer would shoot or a sports photographer would shoot. So wait till you know more about shooting and what kind of photographer you are before you go out and buy any big fancy lenses, no matter what kind of discount you're getting from the sales guy. MacMan says, I'd start with a 3 to 400 millimeter lens. I guess he means a 300 to 400 millimeter lens um, on a Nikon crop body. That's a good suggestion. That, that would be a good, a good suggestion. MacMan says, I think those can go up to one four thousandth of a second. Pretty good. MacMan, I posted a picture I found in the Telegram room a bit ago that made me think of you, Sean. I think you'd enjoy. Okay. Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> I like that picture because I can't get that picture to show the audience. Ah, crap. Why do I save shots? Save as. That reminds me of a... Um, an image I've got on my phone of, or I, for those folks who know me, know I've, I've spoken often about a, uh, a road in North Carolina called um, the Dragon. And the Dragon is an incredible motorcycle road. It's uh, only 11 kilometers long, but in those 11 kilometers, it's 318 curbs. It's a roller coaster ride for motorcycles. It's insane. It is so much fun. You cannot believe how much fun that road is to ride. It is scary, uh, but it is a lot of fun to ride, even if it's only 11 kilometers, 11 kilometers long. The, uh, the road itself is on the Tennessee-North Carolina border, and it's, um, it's only a 30-kilometer-an-hour road, although we all go much, much faster than that when, whenever the police aren't around. And the um, all the roads in that general area are the same. They're all just spectacularly um, well-designed, um, uh, uh, built for fun, for twisties, for that kind of stuff. Um, for the, the idea that you can twist and wind and, and do this. Kind of, and it's not a high-speed road. It's, it's a twisty, windy road. And those are a lot of fun to do on, on the bike. And so um, this picture 
me just post this up so you folks can can see what I'm talking about. This is the shot he's talking about. Windy road, next 99 miles. That, for for a motorcyclist like me, that's just freaking heaven. That's just like the best place in the world to be. That's, we, we, you can't possibly have more fun than that road right there. I don't know where that is. Uh, Mac man, where, where, where is that, uh, where is that road? Uh, do you, do you, do you know, do you, do you know where that, uh, that road exists? The road that I want to go on is in uh, north, northern California, I think, or, or central California. Uh, it's called Highway 36. And I want to go and take this picture. <clears throat> and I want to park my bike right there. Because it's similar. It says, next for the next 140 miles, it's going to be curvy. That just is heaven. <laughs> that would be the most fun you could possibly have. Look at this road. Isn't this beautiful? Highway 36. Um, I don't know where it is. Uh, eastbound Central Valley uh, near the Lassen Volcanic National Monument somewhere in California. That's my road trip. That's my next road trip. If I can if I can manage it. I want to go on that on that road and, and do that ride because that looks like fun. U.S. Highway, Wayne says, U.S. Highway 12, Lolo Pass. Yeah, but what state, guys? <laughs> Highway 12, Lolo Pass doesn't, oh, Idaho. Oh, Idaho. That's even closer than this one, so I could do both. Oh, man. And Idaho's not that far away from, from Vancouver. I can, I can get to Idaho in a day. That, that would be tempting. That would be tempting. Uh, again, as always, send me emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. I love getting emails from you guys. Our good friend Scott Randall over there at the Long Island Macintosh User Group says, um, listen to last week's show, the discussion about the MacBook is almost correct. A user buys what fills their needs. For me, the 11-inch MacBook Air is a better fit than the MacBook. I need the extra ports. When I'm teaching, I attach to a projector. The projector we have is a VGA. I also need an adapter anytime I plug into a projector, and the type always varies. I also always use a mouse and don't like depending on the wireless mouse, which forces me to carry extra batteries. Have you never used one? I have no idea how to judge, or I have no way to judge how good or bad the MacBook is. I just know the features lacking make it the wrong choice for me. However, I, and most people out there, do not have the experience to say that Apple is wrong in putting this computer in the lineup. They have a pretty good batting average at making devices that sell. Also, you can be pretty sure that the first one sold well if they're producing an upgrade. Now, the only incorrect statement you made, Sean, is that it's an entry-level computer. It's not priced that way. It's considerably more expensive than the 11-inch MacBook Air, which offers much more, with the exception of the Retina screen. Entry-level 11-inch MacBook Air with 8 gigs of RAM is $1,000. Entry-level MacBook with only one port and a slower CPU is $1,300. You can get the Retina, lowest weight, but only one port. Uh, now I know this has been long, but a quick thought on driverless cars. I think once these cars get perfected, no one will be driving themselves. In fact, I think they will make it a law. You won't own a motor vehicle. You'll pay a yearly subscription, and the car will pick you up and drop you off at the time you need. Outside of the joy of driving for people who like to drive, everything else is a disadvantage. You won't have to worry about fuel, repairs, upkeep, accidents, hopefully. Insurance, all self-driving cars will presumably have the same safety record, and the company selling the subscription will pay the insurance. Also, don't worry about parking. I'm sure there are lots of other things that I've overlooked. I see it as a win-win. I wouldn't disagree with you, Scott. I think that's exactly where we're going. Now, it's not going to happen in our lifetimes. I don't think we're going to see subscription service for cars in our lifetimes, unless it's for Uber-type cars, where you can subscribe and have uber pick you up whenever you want i think we'll see self-driving cars start off in industries like trucking and public transit i think those and maybe even taxis i can imagine you imagine self-driving cars as taxis 
I think I think that works a lot better, at least in cities too. I think <clears throat> your plan is a good one, except for the fact that it only really works in in urban areas. It doesn't work in the country. There's not enough population density to make that worth it. And what happens when you go to have a car pick you up and they're all busy? Because there won't be one car for every single person. There'll be one car for, what, every 20 people? And the problem nowadays is that we all go to work at the same time. We all come home at the same time. That's why it's called rush hour. So these cars, these driverless cars that are taking us back and forth to work, need to all be available, a lot of them, first thing in the morning and then in the after- afternoons and, and the evenings. So you'll need one car for every two people, maybe. But that means from nine to four, you've got too many cars in the road or too many cars not on the road, as the case may be. There are problems with, with, with your plan. I, I, I don't disagree with you. I think it's definitely subscription models is – a way of going forward. I don't know if they're, they if they would ban driving. I think what would happen is that the government would make driving more expensive. So you'd have higher gasoline costs, higher insurance rates. The cars would be taxed higher and possibly cost more. Um, because you're right, there, there's a certain percentage of the population that loves driving, but just not enough of them to make it worth worth the while. But I, li- I like the idea. I think it's certainly something that we're, 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 we are headed towards. Scott Thrift, also in Sydney, Australia, says, Hey, Sean, just had an experience that reminded me why Apple is in the position it is within the IT world. Having just upgraded my router, I was having some issues with connecting my iOS devices and Google Chromecast to certain internet-based services. Rather than spend hours messing around trying to work it out, I decided to contact the respective company's tech support. The 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 Chromecast, total nightmare. Google provides no online live tech support, so a phone call was required. Answered in an offshore call center, took almost half an hour to be finally told all I needed to do was reset the Chromecast. Apple, brilliant as usual. I was able to do online tech support with a person who understood the issue, was able to walk me through sending a quick support report to him via the automated setting within iOS, and then told me exactly what I needed to do on my iOS devices to fix the problem, even to the point of telling me what settings to change my router to get the best results. Apple again shows why it is the leader in the IT industry. I don't know if they're a leader in IT. I would certainly argue they're the leader in tech support in customer tech support. One of the things I tell folks, uh, my uh, baby sister, Melanie, is uh, thinking about um, buying a Macintosh. And one of the things I told her was, uh, she was worried that she's never used a Macintosh before. And she said, is it hard to to figure out? I said, no, you, you know, you're smart. You'll figure out a lot of it on your own. But I told her that Apple's got excellent tech support for any kind of problems that you have. And for the most part, Apple takes responsibility for your use of the Macintosh. They don't try to pawn you off. You know, as Scott was saying, the Apple rep could have easily pawned him off and said, no, sorry, that router isn't our product. We can't help you with that. But the Apple guy actually helped him configure some other company's router. It's not going to happen every single time, but it's an example of how Apple does things that are beyond the norm in helping its customers out. Uh, That's particularly important for my sister because she doesn't live near an Apple store. The nearest Apple store for her is an hour away in the city of Halifax. And if she bought an iMac, she wouldn't want to be lugging the iMac back and forth. But I told her Apple's got a lot of really great resources, both online and on uh, 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 telephone tech support. 95% 95% of the time when I've had to call Apple, I've had a good experience with tech support. That's be- vastly better than any company I've ever had to deal with in my life. No other company comes close to that. And I will often call tech support just to see what they're going to say about a problem. The most notorious one is you often 
have to call up your internet service provider. There's something going wrong with your computer. Your internet speeds aren't fast, or your router isn't working, or whatever it is. Now, I know how to reset a router and do all those kinds of things, but every now and then I want to call up their tech support and see, is the problem on your end? And it can be a nightmare dealing with ISPs. It was worse back in the days before Apple became popular. I used to be the tech support guy for an ISP here in Vancouver. I was the only only Mac guy. And listening to the, the PC tech supports was like, I'm never buying a PC ever. But the Mac tech support stuff was almost easy. It was always the same kind of problems. So I guess one of the advantages Apple has is this tech support problems are usually easier to fix. But it's also very, very good. The people are very knowledgeable. Um, they tend not to be reading from a script, or if they're reading from a script, they're reading very, very well. They do a very, very good job of tech support. MacMan says, yeah, even my worst Apple tech support experience was better than my best at most of the companies. If I've ever had a tech support experience that I didn't like, I'd hang up and call back and get someone else. And they invariably fixed it. And if they didn't, I'd simply say, send me to level two tech support. And I ne- I've never had to go to level three. I've only ever had one problem with tech support that they haven't been able to fix. And it's they, they want to. I just can't bother to go, go through the hoops. And it's the fact that this machine won't wirelessly airplay to my HDTV. I've still got to plug in an HDMI cable to it. It's supposed to be able to. And my laptop will. And my iOS devices will. But this Macintosh, this iMac, will not wirelessly airplay to that machine. Apple Tech Support says it should. And they've had me do a bunch of things to try to fix it. And they want me to do more, but it's like, eh, it's not that important. That's the only issue I've ever had in 25 years of dealing with, dealing with Apple Tech Support where they haven't been able to fix the problem. But again, they want to. I just can't be bothered to figure it out. Scott, thanks very much for the email. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's it for emails. I think I read that one last week, so I'm going to delete that one. Um, yeah, that's it. Folks, thank you very much. There was something else. What was it? Was it this? Shoot. I know as soon as I get off the air, I'm going to remember what it was. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, uh, crap. Crap and a cracker. No, nope, I can't. I can't think of what it was. I'm just vamping now trying to figure it out. Um, if you haven't yet, spend some time listening to Prince this week. You'll be happy. It will make you happy. It will make you sing. My might make you dance. It does for me. Uh, folks, uh, thanks very much to our good friend Jim Downpour of The Loop at loopinsight.com for joining me here this past week, as he always does. As always, uh, you can listen to us to the to the live show or the archive. If you're listening in on the live show, thank you guys very much for being here live. Live is half the fun of the show. So I always appreciate you guys who are in the IRC chat room and the Telegram room for listening in live to the show. As always, until next week, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to your Mac Life. See ya!